Now, he was tall, with thick, dark hair that just touched his collar. A wayward strand stuck straight up on the top of his head. It had probably been that way since he was five years old. His turtleneck sweater was the color of warm milk. On the empty chair beside him was a stiff, navy blue cap, the kind worn by boys who sold newspapers on the, on the snowy streets of Chicago in 1932. He had strangely perfect teeth for a European. And although it was only one in the afternoon, I could already see the shadow of his beard rising. I was trying not to stare, but his hazel green eyes seemed to be exactly the same color as my own. Like any first date, I knew only a few tantalizing details. The strange name came from Brittany on the Channel Coast of France. His family was in Saint-Malo, a provincial port city he'd fled as soon as possible. He spoke passable English, much better than my high school French, but with an Australian accent that he picked up during his military service at the French Embassy in Canberra. He seemed shy and serious, but broke easily into a wide grin, mostly when I said something was fascinating. <laughs> We had met in late September at an academic conference in London called Digital Resources in the Humanities. I think that qualifies me for nerd sex night right now. <laughs> so, can you think of a less promising place to meet the love of your life? He was finishing up a PhD in computer science. I was starting a master's in art history. I spotted him in a seminar on a hypertext version of Fleeting's Wake. Again, if there's any doubt. <laughs> I knew he had to be European. The Americans were too fresh-faced, and the English so pale and rumpled. I suppose he could have been German, on account of his height, or that hideous blue windbreaker he was wearing. But something about the dark hair, and the square jaw, and the little glasses said café crème. On the last day of the conference, I ran into him on the stairs. And we Americans have that wonderful puppy dog way of running up to somebody with a stupid question and a big smile. I rarely fight it, because in so many situations, it's a gift. I asked him what his research was about, and he took it from there. Art really, artfully worded emails flew back and forth. I even tried writing one in French, begging Gwendal in advance to correct my grammar. He waited several months to tell me that corriger moi doesn't so much mean check my spelling as tickle me with a feather duster. <laughs> there should really be a footnote in those high school textbooks. By December, I'd invented a reason to come to Paris, something about temporary art exhibitions, and now we were here having lunch. I glanced down at the menu, relieved that although I hadn't taken a French class since my sophomore year in college, I could decipher almost all the words on the menu. Chartier's menu is full of classics, steaks and chops, grilled sea bass with fennel seeds, sweet chestnut puree, and wine-soaked prunes. What girl could resist the charm of a restaurant that allows you to order creme de chantilly, just plain old whipped cream, for dessert? You must have missed this when you were in Australia, I said. We had our little tricks, said Gwendal, with a conspiratorial smile. They sent the camembert and the foie gras in the, dip in the uh, valise diplomatique. So since it was French government property, the Australian customs couldn't search it. Um, top secret ser security cables and cheese. I couldn't remember the last time I'd been this hungry. Truth be told, a woman could starve to death in London. It's not just the food, tea and toast are fine for a hangover, but for men. Foppish and charming as they can be, Englishmen have a unique way of making a woman feel invisible. They either look right through you, or they lunge at you in a drunken stupor. <laughs> the only warmth comes from those pitiful gas fireplaces and a couple of pints. Now, I'd studied in Britain before, so I should have been prepared for this. And I'd only been back for three months, but already I was getting tired of the gray skies, and the gray meat, and the slightly grayish men. I was starting to feel a little grayish myself. The waiter slapped down my pavé au poivre. It was not a particularly impressive plate, a hunk of meat, some fat fried potatoes piled carelessly to one side. But something happened when I sliced through the first bite. No resistance, none at all. The knife slid through the meat, the thinnest layer of crusty brown opening to reveal a pulpy red heart. I watched as the pink juices puddled into the buttery pepper sauce. Gwendal looked up. I guess I must have uttered an audible gasp of pleasure. I don't know why you can't get a steak like this in London, I said. I think since Mad Cow, it's actually illegal. I was careful, even in my haste to, to deliver my fork to my mouth, not to drip something on my pale blue sweater. My fork and knife paused in the air as I let the salt and the fat and the blood settle on my tongue. Not to minimize Wendell's many charms, but he was halfway to home base as soon as I cut into that marvelous steak. <laughs>